So this morning we are going to uh, continue our study in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 24 this morning. So if you would, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 24. And as you're looking that up, let me just remind you about what we talked about last week. And we talked about um, God's protection over Paul, right? And through that, it started with respecting authority. And that's something that we struggle with. We're the ones in, in subject, right? When we're the subjects, it's hard to respect those in authority over us, especially when they make decisions that we disagree with. And yet, when we are the ones in authority, we want everybody to respect us, don't we? And it's kind of one of those one-way deals where we like to receive it, but we don't like to give it. And last week, and I, I want to clarify last week because we talked about respecting specifically government authorities. And you may not agree with them, but we still should respect them. And I think a great example of that in Scripture was David and King Saul. Do you remember some of the things that King Saul did to David? He tried to kill him. He threw a spear, right, so hard it missed David, and it actually stuck into the wall. And David fled for his life. And then there was a time, and this is where the Bible gets exciting, right? Saul is out searching for David to kill him, and then he needs to relieve himself. So he goes into a cave. And while he is relieving himself, David sneaks up to him. And when are you more vulnerable than that moment? You are the most vulnerable as a, as, as a person. And David doesn't kill him like his men wanted him to. Instead, he just cut off his robe. And then later on, when, when Saul was done and Saul left the cave and, and was a good, safe distance away, David comes out and says, hey, my king, right? This is what I did, right? He showed proof that he could have killed Saul. But even in that, David felt guilty. And remember that? And he repented. He's like, I should not have done that. So if David could still respect, right, and, and repent when he failed, but still repent his king who tried to kill him physically, shouldn't that be an example that we, because how many of us have had government leaders try to actually kill us physically? You know, maybe some of the decisions we may think that, what are you doing? You're killing me here. But if David could do that, we can do that too. And who, nobody ever said, or maybe somebody did say, but they're wrong, following God isn't easy. Doing the right thing isn't easy. Because if it were, we would all do it without any struggle. But we struggle doing the right thing sometimes, don't you? I know I, know I do. I know I struggle with that. So we learned about respecting authority. And then we also learned that there were some assassins, right? Again, the Bible is exciting. 40 plus assassins, and they vow never to eat or drink until Paul is dead. But Paul's nephew finds out about it, warns Paul, right? Warns Lysias. And then Lysias, in order to protect Paul, gives him 470 bodyguards, 400 foot soldiers and 70 horsemen to, to take him to Caesarea. And just how, you know, we can be worried about this or that. I mean, if you had 40 assassins out to get you, would you be scared? Yeah. I would be scared if, if I knew, if, if there was just one assassin out there trying to get me, I would be concerned. But God protects. When you're doing what he wants you to do, and and Paul already knew that God wanted him to go to Rome. And God protected him in the midst of all of these assassins, in the midst of all these trials that he's going through. He knows that God will protect him. Well, today, we're talking about, you know, Paul, poor guy, he gets transferred from one person to the next to the next. And, you know, he was, he was with Lysias last couple of weeks, Today, he gets transferred to, to a couple more guys, and so there's more hearings, 
more accusations, more stuff, and, and he just kind of gets thrown into it. And I don't know if you've ever been in a form of a legal battle or, or having to give testimony to defend yourself, but I think that would get tiring, defending yourself time after time after time. Frustrating. But here Paul continues on. So before we get into Acts chapter 24, let's just bow our heads in, in a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you again today, and again, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Luke, Lord, that he took record and that he wrote these things down. And I pray, Lord, that as we uh, work through this chapter and, and a bit of the next, that you would just guide and direct us, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, Lord, for what you have for us. And I pray, Lord, that just that through this morning, that our lives would be changed and that we would have just a stronger desire to follow you. Lord, help us to live uh, the life that you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, again, we're talking about a couple of different hearings. This first hearing that we're talking about is before Felix. Now, if you've ever been in a hearing, how does, how does a hearing or a trial start typically? It starts with one lawyer, and what do they do? They make what? An opening statement, and in that opening statement, there are accusations, right? Because the judge or whoever is presiding over the meeting, they want to know why they're there. That makes sense, because if you don't know why you're there, all this information that you're getting, it's not going to mean much. So let's read about the accusations that are brought here before Felix today. So we're going to start with verse 1 of Acts chapter 24. And it says, And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. So he's the lawyer here. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. Before we get into the accusation, just a reminder, right? I, I teach out of the English Standard Version, the ESV. Is there anybody here who is using maybe the King James or the New King James? When you go through that, there's an added verse that we don't have, that I don't have in my Bible, and that's verse 7. And we've talked about this before, that there are portions of Scripture, specifically New Testament, that some writings have included words that others don't. And when the King James was translated, they had these texts, and it included verse 7. Now, again, the original manuscripts, they didn't have chapter breaks. They didn't have verses. That was something that was later on that we put in there just to help us find scriptures. Because if I said we're going to be in Acts today, we're like, oh, no, you know, where are we at? And you'd be searching, flipping, flipping, just trying to find the right page. Um, so they added chapters and verses just to help us follow. Well, later on, archaeologists, they found more manuscripts, ones that predated the manuscripts that were used for the King James specifically. And verse 7 is not included. And through just research, it was determined that that was probably, right, that was not part of the original manuscripts when Luke first wrote it, but it was something that maybe a scribe put in as they made copy just to clarify um, what was going on. So let me read to you the verse, which actually includes part of 6 and, and 8 in, in the King James. But let me read to you so that you can judge for yourselves whether 
it's needed or, or if there's any discrepancies. But here's, here's what it says. Um, and we have judged him according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come before you. Okay, so that's the section that was added. Again, it kind of clarifies some things. Yeah, if you remember a few weeks ago when Paul was in the temple, right? There was a riot and they were getting ready to kill him. But then Lysias sent his troops to protect Paul and brought him out. So there's nothing really new information there. It just maybe helps to remind some readers, oh yeah, this happened a while back. But it doesn't change. And none of these manuscripts, any of the discrepancies that we find nothing is, is left out or added that has anything to, anything to do with theology. There's no new knowledge gained. There's no old knowledge lost. It's just information um, that was not included in the original manuscripts. But let's talk about Tertullus a bit. And this is where, and I know we have a lawyer in our midst, and I'm not talking about you, Okay. But Tertullus is one of the reasons why lawyers get a bad reputation. It's because he's going out there, and what does he do initially to this judge? Well, not judge, but Felix. He says, oh, Felix, you are awesome. We have totally flourished under your leadership, right? Now, what kind of a guy, a leader, wouldn't want to hear that? But when we look at history, we see that Felix was anything but. Under his Under his leadership, there were several riots, Greeks and and Jews, several issues between them. In fact, two years after this, we we learn from history, two years after this, that Felix, basically he gets fired because there was a situation again between the Greeks and the Jews and he did not handle it appropriately. He was a poor leader. So when Tertullus comes up and says, oh man, we've just been doing great under your leadership, he's just blowing smoke, okay? And then what does he do, right? First he butters him up, and then he he says, um, right, we we don't want to take up much of your time. But here is a man, he is a plague. Everywhere he goes, he stirs up riots. Is that true? No, but have there been riots where Paul goes? Yes, but is he the one who is starting those riots? No. So here Tertullus is coming out, and he is just making Paul look as bad as he possibly can. Felix, you're awesome. This man is a plague. He's a leader of of a sect, right? And a sect typically has a bad connotation to it. It's a belief within a belief, you know, and you have Judaism, and then you have Christianity, so it's kind of a sect, but it's not really a sect, and we're going to talk about that later on when Paul actually describes Christianity and Christians, and then he goes on and says he tried to profane the temple. Now, what's interesting is, was that the original charge against Paul when he was first arrested in Jerusalem? What was the charge? He did profane the temple. He brought this Gentile into the temple. But could they prove it? No. Why not? It didn't happen. And so now the charge is he tried to do it. He attempted to do it, which again isn't a crime. But here, Turtleus is just trying to, to sling as much mud as he can against Paul and kind of sees what sticks. This guy's dirty, and we don't know. Chances are he could have been a Roman because it was common for for Jews, if they were going to a a Roman court, to hire a a Roman lawyer because they would know the laws better. They would not, and so it makes sense. Um, And right here, right, he's even, Turtles is saying we. He's identifying himself with the Jews. And so here we have an opening case. Now think about, think about Paul, right? Think, think you're Paul. You're up and you're being charged and somebody's telling you that you're a plague. Somebody calls you a plague. Somebody calls you, right? You're a leader of this horrible sect, right? That defiles and it's against Roman government. In fact, he even tried to go against 
what we Jews believe. What if somebody made those accusations towards you? How would you respond? Has anybody here ever been falsely accused of something? Right? I'm sure you have. How did you respond? Did you respond anger? Maybe you respond attacking the other person, right? Because if they're going to tear me down, I'm going to tear them down too, and I'm going to make up stuff. Well, let's see how Paul responds. Let's read about the defense, because it's Paul's turn to speak, starting with verse 10. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation. I cheerfully make my defense. Okay, so right off there, he's complimentary, but he doesn't say you're awesome. He just says, you've been around for a while, and I'm glad that I'm here to to share my case, right? So he's complimentary, but he doesn't lie. He only speaks the truth. All right, verse 11. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Um, Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, without any crab or tumult. But some Jews from Asia... They ought to be here before you make, (laughs) before you, and to make an accusation, should they have anything against me? Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they have found when I stood before the council. Other than this, one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. All right, so Paul, Paul's defense is, first off, Felix, you can verify it yourself. You can check that I was only in Jerusalem for 12 days. Now, how long does it take for a guy to start and, and create a riot? It takes time. Even in social media that we have today, it takes time. In fact, oddly enough, and God knew that we were going to be talking about this today, But there was a riot in New York City yesterday, or Friday. Yeah, and it one in there was a there was a YouTube influencer who said, "Hey, I'm going to give give away at us, you know, what three o'clock I think on a Friday afternoon, or four o'clock maybe I don't know, whatever." Anyways, a huge riot broke out. Now that was about I think he gave maybe a week's notice, um, and that's already after he had a huge following, a huge influence and using social media. Did Paul have that? No. Here he is. It's only by word of mouth. He's in this city for a week and a half. Is there a way that he could rally up the troops and and do something like that? No. Not possible. And Felix, you can check it out. In fact, you can check it out. Where was I at the time? I was in the temple, and I was being purified. It's hard to start a riot when you're by yourself. Right? How many riots include one person? It it doesn't happen. It starts with a group. It starts with a group. So he says, you can verify. And there is no proof. There is no proof whatsoever. These are just words that they're bringing. Just false accusations. And then he clarifies that the way is not a sect, right? Christianity is not a sect. Christianity, and we've talked about this, is really has its foundings in Judaism, the Old Testament. For Christians, the Old Testament is so important to us. 
And the difference between Christianity and modern-day Judaism is what? Jesus Christ. See, we believe that Jesus Christ is, was, right, the coming Messiah that was predicted for all those years. Whereas Judaism, they're still looking for the Messiah. Other than that, we believe what they believe. And that's what Paul is saying. It's like we believe the exact same things, except I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't. I believe that he is what was the coming Messiah. You don't. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. And so we're not so different. So when people say, oh, Christianity didn't begin until the first century, no. Christianity began at creation. We didn't just come to be. We've always been. And um, so he says the only thing he's guilty of, right? The only thing he's guilty of is believing in the resurrection, Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm falsely accused, I kind of get upset and I'll defend myself. But if I'm guilty, hey, I'm guilty. There was a time when I was younger that I got pulled over for speeding. And I wasn't. And I had a witness, and I'm not sure, I don't know how it happened, but anyways, he tagged me for speeding. He came up to me and I said, I did not speed. I didn't. And, you know, he let me off. But then there was another time where I did get pulled over again for speeding. And that time, I was speeding. I was going, believe it or not, I was going to church. I just wasn't paying attention. I'm just driving down. I'm just, I'm just going along. Did I fight him that time? No. For a couple of reasons. One is I knew I was guilty of speeding. Plus, there were other times that I was speeding and I didn't, and I didn't get caught. So I deserved it. And I had no problems with that. I was guilty. Paul, the same way. He's like, hey, if I'm guilty of something, kill me, right? If I'm guilty of such a a horrible crime, I'll pay the penalty. But he didn't. And then he makes something, too, that's kind of comical. These accusations of, of the riots that happened, Who's accusing him of that? The Asian Jews, right? The Jews from Asia. And where are they? They're not there. Do courts like to have witnesses when testifying against somebody? Especially if it's like a a death penalty, which is what the Jews were, were wanting. They were wanting witnesses for a death penalty. So not only did they not have witnesses... Of, of Paul, right, creating these riots, starting these riots all over the world. But they also didn't have any witnesses for really what happened in the temple in Jerusalem because these leaders weren't there at that time. It was the, the, the Jews throughout Asia that had been following Paul and just trying to ruin his ministry. They are the ones that had been working out against him. So they're not there to prove and so here's Felix, he hears both sides, these accusations, he, he hears the defense, and now it's time for him to come up with the ruling. Okay, what do I do? What would you do if you're judge? You have these heinous accusations, and then you have the defense say, where's the proof? Show, show me the proof. If I'm guilty, fine. But if I'm not, leave me alone. I'm innocent. Let's read about that, verses 22 to 27. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, right, he was familiar with Christianity, put them off saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that that he, talk about Paul, should be kept in custody but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came in with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. And he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present, 
When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So we see here, right, what did Felix do? You know what? I'm not going to make a decision here. Because he can't, right? Either he does what should be done and sets Paul free, but then who's going to be mad? The Jews. And he's got to kind of keep them happy. And so instead of making a decision, he just says, you know what? I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait till Lysias comes. We actually have no record of Lysias ever coming. But this happens for two years, right? So Paul remains in custody. Um, and through that time, he's given a lot of opportunity, right? A lot of freedoms. His friends can come and go and, and give him what he wants. He has like, unlimited access during that time. And Felix wants to talk to him. And so there's several times where he goes to talk to Felix. Now, did Felix want to really know the truth? It says here, no, what did he want? He wanted money. Because he's like, well, you know, if I work the system right, if Paul gives me money, then yeah, maybe I'll let him go. Because hey, who doesn't love money, right? And so here we see him, and he's, he's there for two years. And then when we read here, right, that when two, that when two years had elapsed and Felix was succeeded, right, as Felix leaves, because it was a bad situation when he gets fired. It's a, it's a really bad situation. So he leaves Paul there to kind of appease the Jews. Saying, hey, I messed up. I know it was, it, it was a bloody thing that happened. I'm going to give you, I'm going to keep Paul here as kind of like a peace offering. Please don't get mad at me <laughs> for my mistake. And so that happens. So now, right, Felix is in charge. So let's read, or Festus is in charge, I'm sorry. So now let's read about uh, the hearing before Festus. And it starts off with another plot. There's another plot to get him. So let's read verses 1 to 5 of Acts chapter 25. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, right, he just starts his new job. He went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man... Let them bring charges against him. All right, so here's what's happening. A new guy, a new leader. And what happens? These Jews want to be buddy-buddy with him and say, hey, you want to do us a favor? You, you want us to be happy? Especially after, after Felix had left under such bad circumstances, it's now time for him to, to throw him a bone to the Jews to start off on a good foot. And we see that, don't we? If you've ever been in a job where there's a new boss that comes, you know those people that just kind of flock around them, right? And, and try to, hey, I know you're new here, but there, these are some changes that really need to happen. You know people like that. And even in, even in churches, that happens as well. And I've been in churches where a new pastor comes on and the people just kind of, hey, what are your thoughts about this? Hey, this would be a really good thing. The last guy, he was starting to do it, but didn't quite get it done. Here's your opportunity. And if you do it, man, you're going to make a lot of us happy. If you don't know somebody like that, maybe you do and just aren't aware, or maybe even you <laughs> are that person. I hope you're not, but that's what they were doing. They, they were coming, and they were, again, trying to butter him up just to, to bring Paul out. Of protection, so that they could, so that they could kill him. But um, Felix or Festus, like sorry, I'm getting those confused. Festus was like, you know what? 
I'm going to go there anyway. I'm on my way to, to Caesarea. Why don't you guys come with me? Bring some leaders, and we'll go and we'll settle this out instead of going, going back and forth. And so they do. So let's read about more illegitimate accusations. Verses 6 and 7. Let's read that. It says, after he stayed among them, right? This is talking about Festus. Not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. And the next day he took his seat on the, on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood against him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Man, okay, so what has Paul done these past two years? He's been captive, right? He's been a prisoner. So now they're not only bringing three charges. How many charges are they bringing? Numerous charges. Things that throughout the years, ooh, what can we, what can we bring up against them? This and this and this. So they just have a lot of accusations, but no proof. Again, put yourself in Paul's shoes for over two years People are just falsely accusing you, left and right. How many of you could put up with that for two years? How many of you could put up with that for one year or a month? Maybe even a day we would struggle with somebody making those false accusations. Illegitimate. Well, how does Paul respond? Verse 8, Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. Right? Paul maintained innocence. Paul maintained innocence. Guys, I haven't done anything wrong. If I had, do you think it would take two years to come up with enough evidence to convict a person? If a trial takes that long in order to convict somebody, you think they're just, they're just trying to come up with something. It just seems that there's so much hate for Paul that they are just trying and struggling to come up with enough evidence to convict him. If they can't, if it takes more than two years, you think there's probably not a whole lot to it. It's just that they hate this guy and they are just trying to come up with anything, any way in order to get him convicted. And so... Let's read about Paul's appeal. But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back. Um, Let's start with verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried, which we looked at last week. That's where he should be tried. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to, to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. And then this famous quote, right? I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Is Paul really looking for a way out? No. He knows that the Jews are out to get him. But where is Paul's destination? Rome. He knows he's going to Rome. And after being locked up for a couple years... Same thing over and over and over again. He says, I appeal to Caesar. Which means, under Roman law, that means, yeah, as a Roman citizen, he gets to go to Caesar. And where is Caesar? Rome. So that's where he's going. After all this time, after all this energy, right? Paul is finally going to be able to begin his journey to Rome. And I hope this morning that you look at Paul and that you realize all of the things that he went through in order to follow God. He went through so much, just not just being like locked up, 
even though he had freedoms, he was still you know, under house arrest, just being falsely accused time after time after time. But he maintained faithfulness. So let me ask you this. If somebody accused you of doing something negative, would there be evidence? We as believers, we should remain innocent. We should have nobody, we should have no say, hey, you know what, he, you know, Pastor Dave, he robbed a bank yesterday. Did you, did you see that? He robbed a bank. It's like, well, where's the evidence? Well, here we have you on camera or, you know, whatever. Then, okay, yeah, I'm guilty. But these false accusations, and they're just trying to tear people down. They're trying to tear you down. They may try to tear you down. But if you live a life that's righteous before God, will people listen to them? Maybe some. But it won't have any teeth. But if you are guilty of causing riots, is that something Christians should do? Should we be like, man, let's go out, let's start a riot? Should we? No. We're not called to that, right? We're called to peace. We're called to share the truth and love. So think about that this week. Think about Paul and what he went through in order to get the word out, in order to share the gospel with others. Let's pray.